3.4 million dollars in 1872, 5.7 in 1871, and 10.8 million dollars in 1869. Those numbers adjusted for inflation are only some of the results of the big bank robberies executed by George Leonidas Leslie. And the final heist he orchestrated is still the largest in US history. In today's money, $81 million haul, which he somehow never saw play out due to a mysterious murder. All this in today's episode of Expanding Horizon. George Leonidas Leslie was born in New York City in 1842. After moving to Ohio with his family, he went on to graduate from the architecture program at the University of Cincinnati and opened his own firm afterwards. In short, he had a promising future one can imagine. But then life caught up with him. His parents died and he moved to New York, quitting his job to pursue easy money, as he put it. The first step of his get-rich-quick scheme was surprisingly not pursuing a dropshipping career, but taking up residence at the prestigious Fifth Avenue Hotel, a gathering place for the ultra-elite, including their president, Ulysses S. Grant. However, what all these men didn't know was that Leslie was not there to make friends. He was planning to rob the very banks where they were storing their riches. As you might know though, maybe because you tried already, robbing a bank isn't quite easy, and it for sure wasn't the kind of profession one could learn from books or Netflix series. That's when the architect met his connection to the criminal underworld, Frederica Marm Mandelbaum, New York's greatest fencer. Back then, bank vault locks were thought to be unbreakable. Relying on explosives to break into vaults was essential for most robbers. But Leslie had other plans. As an architect, he could study the blueprints of the banks and identify weak spots and points of entry. If that's not enough, he was also mechanically gifted and had an idea for a small device that could be inserted into a lock to open it by nonviolent means. And the most important part, as we already know, he made many friends who were members of high society. Therefore, he was trusted and nobody would suspect him. Genius! Then after a few months, he got a shot at his first bank robbery. His target? Ocean National Bank in New York City. You might think that he immediately went and robbed the bank during one of the following nights, but no. His preparations took three months and entails the following. A few months prior, Leslie deposited some money at the bank and became friends with the bank's president. Using this new friendship, he got a friend who was, unbeknownst to the president, a member of the gang employed at the bank. The architect often went to the bank to make withdrawals, carefully observing the layout the entrances and exits, and the location at the vault. He determined the exact type of lock used on the vault, then purchased a similar model to experiment with at home and even built a small device called the Little Joker that he could insert behind the dial of the lock and use to crack the code. And finally, in June 1869, he made his move. And this is what happened. After the guards had gone, the planted employee let him in so he could install his Joker device. When the tellers used the vault the next day, the little joker would be etched with cuts where the three numbers were, limiting the combinations. This helped them to get through the first door. For the two remaining ones and the safes, they relied on other tools. Jimmies, wedges, sledges, nippers, and drills. You can imagine how confused the officers were when they saw that the main door to the vault was not damaged, as if a ghost went through it. And this was just the beginning. Authorities estimated that his exploits accounted for 80% of all bank robberies in the entire U.S. during his active years of 1869 to 78. In 1876, Leslie decided that the Northampton Bank would be his next big strike. Even though the bank had decided to install a supposedly invincible new lock a few years earlier that required both a key and a combination, the architect didn't back off. He found the man who had installed the new system and offered him a cut of the action. The employee made a copy of the keys and handed them to the bank's cashier, who was later kidnapped by the criminals and forced to give them the key and combination. They collected loot worth $39 million, but there was one problem, and it was a big one. Most of the haul was in non-negotiable bonds, meaning only the person whose names were on the slips could cash it in. The robbery was a bust and even led to the arrests of several of Leslie's helpers. Two years later, there was another problem. A robbery left an uncompromising cashier, dead. All this led to tension between Leslie and other criminals, especially Shang Draper. He wasn't amused with Leslie taking 50% of the cut for himself and only leaving the other half to the rest of the group. 
As if that's not enough, he began to grow suspicious that the architect was having an affair with his wife. Leslie, however, was focused on something else, the biggest bank heist there had ever been. And his target? The Manhattan Savings Institution, the largest bank in the city. His preparation was the same, but this time he had a different plan for the act itself. He planned on turning his back on his gang at the last minute and work with another one on the crime. One last robbery. Everything was perfect and ready, but Leslie never got a chance to pull it off. In October 1878, the gang used his plans to break into the bank and took $81 million in today's money with them. A number never matched. But the brain of it all wasn't there to see it happen. On June 4, 1878, a few months before the robbery, George Leonidas Leslie's decomposing body had been discovered along the Hudson River. He had been shot, and while the murder was never sold, there was a strong suspicion that his colleague Draper was the killer. His funeral was the perfect demonstration of his dual existence, a mix of crime lords, cops and financiers. The genius architect criminal was buried under his real name, George Howard, the man who lived in the shadows. If you liked today's episode, make sure to leave a like and subscribe. And if you haven't already, make sure to check out our last video where we talk about the world's most livable city.